we will go ahead and get started. My name is Erica Zambello. I'm the communications director for Audubon Florida, and I'm so excited to start this webinar, the advanced JWatch training. It, it's going to be a lot of fun to see the different behaviors of all these uh, scrub jays and to learn more about them. So I want to introduce Dr. Marian Carosi. She's our Director of Bird Conservation at Audubon, Florida, and she will be running this presentation today. Because we're such a big group, we are not going to answer questions via video or via raised hands, so you don't have to worry about that. If you do have a question, please go to our chat box. Our illustrious Jackie Sulik is monitoring the chat box throughout the presentation. So if she can answer your question as we're going along, she will do that. We will also have a question and answer period at the end when I will read your question and Marianne will get to it. So like I said, feel free to use the chat box at any time during the presentation. Jackie will answer what she can and the rest of the questions we will answer at the end of the webinar. You don't need to raise your hand. You don't need to, you won't be able to unmute yourself. So don't worry about that. And uh, we will go ahead and get started. Mary Ann, take it away. Thank you for the introduction, Erica. So I wanna start out this um, webinar by saying this is the first time that Audubon Florida staff have taught the advanced training. Uh, and certainly the first time I've taught it. Um, in the past few years since we initiated advanced training, we partnered with um, the Fish and Wildlife Commission and Dr. Carl Miller um, and Dr. Reed Bowman at Archbold Station. And we had some of those experts teaching um, on-site advanced training. This year, we did schedule an advanced JWatch training to be held at Highlands Hammock State Park. Um, and of course, along came COVID-19 and we were unable to have that training occur in person. In future years, we will likely uh, reinstitute on-site advanced trainings where we have an in-field component. But um, these webinars have been very successful, have drawn a lot of people who might not have been able to attend uh, an on-site training. So I think we will uh, continue in future years. So for this training, while it's fresh in your mind, after we finish um, this webinar, uh, I would really invite all of you to email me um, feedback about this training. You know, what did you like? What did you not like? Did you have trouble reading any of the slides? Uh, trouble with the videos? Uh, do you want to learn more about a particular topic that we discussed? or less about a particular topic we discussed, or do you wanna learn about some other topic that we did not discuss? So uh, you won't hurt my feelings. I'm looking for really uh, frank, you know, uh, authentic feedback. So with that, let's get started. And I did forget one thing, which I've forgotten on the other trainings, but this webinar is being recorded. So if you can't catch something or you you're not taking notes, don't worry, this whole thing is being recorded and we will send it out. I just wanted to remind folks of that. Yeah, we're sending out all of the, the links to all three webinars will come in one email that will also um, have the training manual with it. So you'll be able to review the, uh, all three of the, the webinars we've done. Okay, so a brief overview of today's um, training session. Uh, first section is about behavior, um, mostly video centered. The second section is about being a better surveyor in the field. And then the last section is about being a better data recorder. Next slide. First video, so I'm gonna watch and then we'll watch it again. Oh, what happened? So this scrub jay, which is an adult, right? Blue on the side of the uh, back and back of the neck. Um, this is an adult jay that has flown up and perched in the top of a shrub. So this jay could have 
uh, flown up uh, right when you got when you arrived at the survey station, or this J could be 200 feet away. It's not vocalizing. It's curious. It's heard you, and it wants to see what's going on. So this is a point. Uh, this is a, a a job, if you will, of a cooperative breeding group where one bird perches up high when they hear something unusual and they check it out. And if they think there's a uh, danger or something that the other birds in the group need to take a look at, you know, they'll, they will vocalize in a certain way that you're going to hear in the next video. So this scrub jay has, is also in a sentinel function, up high in a perch high in a scrub oak, and it's vocalizing, okay? It's, it's, that is a call that alerts the other birds in the group that there's something going on in the surroundings. Um, it's not really agitated. If this bird was really agitated and flicking its tail, it would generally draw other members of the group up into the, the uh, shrub to take a look also. But this one's definitely letting the other birds in its group know that there's something going on. You can play that one again. And again, this is an adult. This is kind of a motley looking uh, scrub jay, a little scruffy looking around the, uh, the side of the head and the chest. It could be an older bird or it just could be a bird not in top physical condition, but it's definitely adult because it's got blue on the back of the neck. Okay, next video. Oh, okay. So the, the video that follows this is um, going to illustrate some behavior. And behavior can be a really important uh, clue to tell you whether there are uh, jays present that are in more than one family group. So sometimes you'll see jays fly into a, a, a scrub oak where there are other jays and you'll see some squabbling going on. And then you'll see one bird chase another one out of the tree or you'll see a couple come in and perch and you'll see one or two birds start chasing the others away. That's generally indicative that there's more than one family group there. I, unfortunately, I don't have a video of that right now. Um, it's one of those things that uh, we would like to get. So in the next um, video though, you're gonna see uh, an example of dominance and displacement. Next slide. So what happened there is a subordinate um, scrub jay, a less dominant scrub jay, was going to get an acorn probably or, or uh, an insect and a more dominant jay flew in um, and, just, and took it, <laughs> whatever the, the other bird was after. So this is, a, this is a dominance display, but there's no chasing. So you're seeing uh, birds that are most likely in the same family group with this kind of behavior. Next slide. So what you're seeing in this video is three really pissed off scrub jays. <laughs> so this is 
this is significant agitation. They're all vocalizing, they're all flicking their tails and jumping around. This is most likely in response to a playback. Um, there's an observer standing there and they've been playing, you know, scrub jay um, disturbance calls, mobbing calls. And you've got three birds. I think I got a close look at one point and I believe these were all three adults. There is probably something there that could be a nest, could be young juveniles that they're protecting. There is some reason that these birds are highly agitated. Um, this doesn't, this is not random, it's not normal. So this is one of the times when you might want to uh, use additional playback. Make sure you stay and see if you can figure out if there are young juveniles somewhere around. They may pop up, they may be, uh, they may come forward on the second or third uh, playback. So when you're out in the field, really look at how the birds are responding to your playback. Are they just curious? Are they slightly agitated? Are they really agitated? When they're really agitated, they're usually protecting younger birds. Next slide. Here's the whole family, four J's. So if I ask you all, if you can tell whether these are adults or juveniles, you'd probably say, mm, it'd be tough, right? So there's a reason for that. So when you're out in the field doing surveys, remember that the J's consider you a predator. So what happens is the scrub jays will all pop up where they're backlit, okay? That means when they're backlit, they can get a really good look at you, but you're gonna have a hard time aging these birds. You know, you can count them because you can see there are four birds up there, but aging them is gonna be a lot tougher. The only way around this is for you to move off the road, move away from the survey station, give them a berth, walk off the road, um, you, you know, different directions, more than one person in your group. But this is very, very typical, you know, poor lighting. And unfortunately also, um, none of these birds are what I call pencil neck birds, where their necks are so skinny that you can obviously tell they're juveniles. I would guess there are probably at least one juvenile in this group, but to verify that, you're gonna to have to get off the road and get to where you can see the birds a lot better than in this video. Next slide. Okay. Your guys hanging out? <laughs> so. Now this is pretty good lighting. So you ought to be able to age these birds. Anybody want to vote in the chat box? Play it one more time, Erica. Are you guys hanging out? <laughs> Just so. Yep, you guys got it pretty much, most everybody, all three adults. So it's important to keep your binoculars, you gotta move. Um, it, these birds are staying foot, uh, put, which is a really wonderful thing because um, it, as many times as not, they are, you know, one, they'll perch and then one will drop down, another one, and then you have to figure out which was which and you have to keep looking at all three birds. But in this case, because they're staying put, you can go from one to the next and next. Okay, adult, adult, adult. Sooner or later, they'll turn their heads away from you and you get the back of the neck color. Or in the case of the upper, right, upper left bird, you can see the sharp break between the blue on the back of the neck, the nape, and the gray patch on the upper back. Next slide. And this is the female hicking. 
So she'll throw her head back. So if there is an a, uh, audio in the playback you're using of a female hicking, you will, uh, sooner or later, you're gonna see, have, a, have another um, dominant female in the group that will fly in and will start hicking to drive you away because she thinks there's another female in her territory. So the females, uh, this is specific call to the females. Go ahead and play it again. Only the females do that. That is an adult, but uh, young females by the end of their first summer, August, September, they are already giving that call. So this is a, this is a learned call, but it is only the females. You can write that down on your, on your data sheet. Next slide. Okay, and go ahead and play that one. Five. What does this call mean? So this is Ralph Risch, who's a scrub jay biologist at Seminole State Forest in one of our uh, annual events. Um, Ralph did his rendition of uh, a seven or eight um, calls of scrub jays. So I want you to listen carefully. This is a soft call on purpose. Five. What does this call mean? So that is a what you what you call a close contact call. These are scrub jays. They're not agitated. Uh, they're just kind of talking to each other and staying in touch. Um, so this is, uh, there's no disturbance. Um, they're, they're foraging, they're preening, they're whatever they're doing. And you'll hear this sometimes um, if you listen carefully. So there's a whole variety of calls, um, agitation calls to non-agitated. Uh, so I, I see somebody saying I couldn't distinguish that one. Basically, it sounds like er, 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 er. It's a there's a you know space of a second or two between those calls, very uh, very soft. But that's, it's just called a contact call. It's like a lot of birds do when they're foraging. Um, you'll hear pileated woodpeckers calling back and forth. They're just keeping in touch with each other so they know where they are spatially. Next slide. Uh, here's a good one. So the first part, you're seeing a really young juvenile here, but listen to what's happening in the background. Yes, that was a baby being fed. So what you're seeing in the foreground is a juvenile scrub jay. It's hungry, no doubt, and that's why it's picking at things. It's picking at the palms. It's, you know, and they're pretty fearless. You know, this bird hasn't been uh, attuned to danger yet. So uh, Jackie and I were actually at this site uh, doing a survey together at Greenway's Triangle and watching this juvenile and when we happen to hear in the background, this other sound, so it sounds like a whining sound, and then all of a sudden it'll go grr, 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 grr. That's being fed. You know, that's when the, an, an adult has flown in behind where we're shooting this video, and it's giving, you know, the baby uh, some food. So listen to it one more time.
that was fortuitous to capture that. So I do want to say one thing about this. If you hear that, um, you know, a baby being fed, please do not approach those birds. Please back away. Um, you'll get the parents really frightened. You get the, the, uh, the really young juvenile could be harmed. Just please, please give them a wide berth if you hear this. Uh, next slide. So um, behavior can be a real clue to uh, whether there's more than one family group. Um, this is not a video. Um, so you see these three birds perched in one tree. Um, would you think, you know, based on what we've talked about, would you think that these are part of one family group or more than one group? Looks good. Thanks for your answers, yes. Um, they are uh, very likely one family group. They're all sitting there pretty quietly, complacently, um, just watching. They're, they're observing us, whoever's taking the photo. Um, so you don't see fighting, squabbling. Um, yes, this is just one uh, brief flash in time but you could consider this, uh, if the birds are just hanging out and sitting there in the same tree and they're not squabbling, that's one family group. Next slide. So um, one other thing I wanted to point out. So I'm gonna give you guys uh, like a minute to look at this slide. How many scrub jays do you see? And there are scrub jays in the photo, by the way, more than one. The point being, of course, sometimes they are really camouflaged and hard to see. Do they do this deliberately? I don't know, but it makes it tough, you know, given the lighting. So you all are good. Most of you got three. Uh, next slide. So there they are. Of course, the advantage you would have on site is that uh, you'd be standing there and you'd be able to observe, you know, for, well, as long as you want, probably, but you would probably see the birds move, maybe the trees, the cones are um, moving, and you'd be able to pick these out. But sometimes you really need to observe closely. Um, and make that effort. If you see movement, you see birds fly up, and you know you need to you need to really take a good long look. And also, if you want to age them, um, again, you're going to have to wait until they move around a little bit. So observation, good observation, is really key. Sometimes a good camera can be helpful if you have somebody on your team who can take a photo of each find and take a photo of each one of these birds um, and then zoom in. Uh, that can be helpful also, especially if you're looking for leg bands. Next slide. Um, okay, this was a point that I wanted to make because I've seen people talk about this on uh, their data sheets. Um, we do our surveys between mid-June and mid-July. Scrub jays may be on their second nest and may have young juveniles still in or close to a nest. So I've seen this happen when I've been on site doing surveys um, and we realized what it was one time, uh, was it, I think it was at one of the advanced trainings as a matter of fact. Um, you may be giving the playback, you're giving the playback and you hear jays and, you, and they're very agitated. You hear that a harsh mobbing, continuous calling and they're, they seem fairly close. Usually scrub jays are curious and they'll come out to where you are at the survey station or they'll pop straight up 
so that they're visible uh, to you and you can at least get an idea that, you know, of how many J's there might be there. But if you hear the J's, they're very agitated, but they won't come all the way to you at the survey station. Chances are they are guarding young juveniles that are still in the nest tree or the nest shrub. They're not going to come to you. Um, they've invested a lot of energy uh, in the eggs, the eggs have hatched, they've invested a lot of energy in feeding those nestlings. And now the kids are old enough to be moving around out of the nest. They're not fledged yet. They can't fly well yet. They're at a very vulnerable point in their life cycle. Um, they probably are small, you know, look much like the, the one in this photo. The tails are not fully grown, so they're gonna have trouble, you know, breaking and turning, uh, which is the function of the tail. So, um, Again, be very careful in this situation. Um, you can know that if there are young juveniles there, there are probably at least two adults there. Um, so you can note this on your spreadsheet, on your data sheet, you know, two adults, um, and describe the agitation and that they would not come all the way to you. You may encounter this. Um, especially if you're doing surveys in late June, you're less likely to have this uh, occur in July just because of their nesting cycles. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this illustrates, um, it was an experience that I had when I was teaching an on-site training at Flamingo Villas, um, which is part of Lake Wales National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, they haven't burned in there in a long time. They did recently, but uh, we were in an area that was very dense and overgrown. Uh, I had a whole group there. I was playing the playback and there were three juveniles that popped up in a sort of a bank of dense scrub oaks. They did not um, fly, they didn't perch on the top. They were below the top, sort of down, you know, a couple of feet below the top. And I could hear all this sort of whispering calling going on uh, down on the ground below them. And like a fool, I kept, you know, doing the playback, wondering why the whole family group wasn't coming out. And someone walked past me in a little farther down the trail ahead of me, about another 10 feet. And all of a sudden a Cooper's Hawk exploded out of the scrub oaks. So, the moral of the story is the Jays knew that the Cooper's Hawk was there and I didn't get it. Um, this is one of those situations where you see really odd behavior. You don't really know what it is. The birds know. The birds know that there was a predator there and they're not going to come out. So what I was hearing was the adults trying to keep the juveniles from, you know, flying out into the open constant chatter of the adults, you know, this whisper call. And they were telling those, uh, those uh, juveniles that there was danger there not to come out. And I was standing there being a big source of disturbance. So, you know, lesson learned. Um, you may encounter this as well, especially on sites where the scrub is very dense and overgrown. Next set, uh, slide. Okay, so we're gonna move into another section here. Um, this is about recording data while moving between successive survey points. Um, it's a question that we're asked a lot, you know, if we uh, have finished working at a survey station, we get in our, our truck or our UV TV and we're moving, we're driving to the next uh, station, it's a couple of hundred meters away, which is five or 600 feet and we see some scrub jays, what do we do? Should we stop? Should we use playback? Okay, yes, stop, no playback. Next slide. So this is an example. Um, you had a family group at station number two, you moved to number three, there were no jays right there, but now you're moving between survey stations three and four, and you encounter jays. You do want to record this, um, you don't use playback because you may draw the AJs and the BJs to you at station three. 
it's not that that's not helpful, it's just that it could be more confusing than anything else. And you don't wanna use the playback except at the survey stations. So uh, you wanna record a line on your data sheet between stations three and four, we encountered whatever it was, two adults, one juvenile. Um, and then move on to station four and, do, and use your usual routine um, with the playback. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Uh, back one. Okay, so there are a lot of good reasons to leave your survey point or your survey station. Um, it, it, like I showed in the, the video with four birds in the uh, tops of the trees, you can't age them. You can count them, but you can't age them. So you have to write that down as four unknowns. You know, you could probably guess there's a couple of uh, adults, but you don't really want to do that. You really want to get a better idea. Um, to detect fledglings, you may have to get a little bit closer. Uh, you also may have to get off the road or walk farther down the road. You can split up your group a little bit. I mean, not permanently, but, but uh, you know, have members walk off in different directions um, to try and detect the entire family group. Okay, next slide. So, I'm trying to think uh, why, oh, so let's say you finish your survey at um, station four and you move on to station five. Um, you want to know whether these birds are gonna follow you. You, want, you, need to, you may need to split up, leave somebody, because you know you had birds at station four, um, have somebody walk to station five and see if the birds from station four follow you all the way to section, uh, station five. Okay, next slide. So, you know, in this, this further illustrates, um, it is best, you know, what I need to know when I am interpreting the data is, you know, are these birds that you're seeing at station X the same birds that you saw at the previous station or is this a different family group? One of the best ways to tell that is to have somebody backtrack. Um, if you get Jays at station five or you leave somebody at station four and have them walk um, towards station five to see whether the Jays follow you. So, in terms of this whole data set, the JWatch data set, what's really important that are um, the number of family groups, because that's a functional unit that supports this species. Uh, but the other, and the other thing is the total number of birds, okay? If people cannot age all of the birds in a group, the rules are, quote unquote, that I count them as adults because what we do not want to do is overestimate the number of juveniles. It is less, it's less of a problem. You know, we know that juveniles are birds, so we can get the total number of birds, but we don't want to overestimate breeding success because that's a key indicator for habitat condition. So it's really important to know whether there's more than one group because if, if, you know, if I end up interpreting the data that there's only one group here, um, that means I've really, you know, undercounted the number of total birds. I'm, I'm counting half as many birds, you know, roughly as there actually are. So that's where it's so important for you all to help me understand whether there's more than one family group there. Next slide. So what's also common in these large blocks of scrub habitat where the trails or the roads uh, are around strictly the, the edges of the property, the edges of the scrub, is that you may be uh, using your playback. You get, let's say you're at station four and you've got Jays right there. Um, you know this is a family group, 
but one of your teammates says, oh, look, a couple hundred feet away, there's a scrub jay perched at the tall of a, uh, top of a pine snag and it's just watching us. You can be assured that that is a different group because that bird's not coming anywhere near you. It is not agitated. Um, it's just watching you, but it hears all the, the ruckus with its neighbors. It hears your playback and it's just watching. This is not uncommon at all. And uh, the, the trails in your path, your service stations may skirt this area entirely so that that bird, that group never gets counted unless you go in there to physically count how many birds are there in that group. Next slide. So you can pick a spot off the map um, and uh, you know, choose how dense a, a scrub you wanna walk through. But please, if you see this bird that is continuing to perch as you move around the center of the, of the scrub acreage, um, at some point, please uh, do move off the road, whoever's brave enough or whatever, or a couple of people, make sure you stay oriented. Um, but move off the road and see if you can tally that family group, figure out how many adults and juveniles are in that interior group. Next slide. So um, this basically illustrates again, the, um, these large areas of scrub. Um, these are burn management units. So uh, the site managers aren't going to want to plow uh, a road or a trail through the middle of these units because that will act like a fire break. So they may leave these large areas of scrub intact for management units. But again, there could be scrub jays that strictly have a territory interior to uh, these larger blocks of habitat. Next slide. So do territories overlap? Not always, not ordinarily, but sometimes yes. So this was an example. Um, and I can't remember which track this is, but so the territory at the, the bottom left, LK 1811, there was a young male in this territory that was functioning as a helper bird. Um, and he found a, uh, a mate in another family group and established a new territory, LKO, uh, Lake Kissimmee State Park, excellent. Um, and uh, he and the female established a new territory, LK 1813, just to the north of 1811. Because the male in 1813 was related to the adults in 1811, the adults in 1811 tolerated some degree of incursion uh, by that pair into their territory. So it was actually mapped as an overlap. Probably what was happening, you see the overlap is on top of a road, um, fire break. So probably the birds were caching acorns in there, um, 1813. And um, the, the adults, you know, the adults in 1811 did not chase them off because they're closely related. So this is one reason where you can sometimes see less of a conflict if the birds are related. Um, you'll still see some chasing during nesting season, but you may not see uh, the degree of agitation that you might otherwise see if the neighbors uh, in territories are unrelated. Next slide. Okay, maps and data sheets. We knew there was gonna be some of that, right? Okay, next slide. So <clears throat> by now I hope everybody's using the new uh, data sheets. Um, new, that what's new in these relatively new is that almost in the center you see a column entitled number, uh, the pound sign UNK, unknown age. This is a column in which you enter birds that you cannot uh, age for whatever reason, doesn't matter. 
please only put the number of adults and juveniles in those columns if you are absolutely certain. What was happening in previous years before we introduced this number of unknown birds is people were putting uh, a number and then another number with a question mark. So for example, somebody might put in a, in a number of adults two dash one question mark. So then I don't know whether that means one of the two, you're not sure if it's an adult or did it mean there are definitely two adults and one you're not sure if it was an adult, it could have been a juvenile. So it was very, very confusing to me on the uh, uh, interpretation end. So please use the number of unknowns and be honest about it. There's no, there's no point, you know, in, in not just saying, I, I, we couldn't do it. We couldn't figure out how old the bird was. We just couldn't get a good look at it. There are any number of reasons why that happens. Also, uh, what was new on this data sheet is the column uh, second from the right, map reference ID. That is your group letter. So group A, the first group you encounter of, of each day is gonna be your A group. Um, you know, B group, C group, D group. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, that as you go along. And hopefully you all have looked at all the other comments on here. That's the, those were the two most important things I wanted to draw attention to. Um, except for, yes, use all the comment lines you need to use. And uh, we'll look at that in a, another slide or two. Next slide. Okay, so you're going to give the first group you encounter each day the letter A in a circle. Make sure it's large enough that I can read it. Please do not write small on the maps. Um, yes, there's a scale on the map, but if you write really small, by the time it's um, scanned and emailed to me, I'm, I may have trouble reading that. So make sure your lettering is clear. Um, you wanna show uh, movement uh, with arrows, indicating if they flew away from you, towards you, uh, whatever, back and forth across the road. Um, use a different letter for each group seen in the order you encounter those groups. The survey um, stations, like the same, a team will survey um, stations in a different order each day. There was one person a couple years ago who tried to number backwards based on where they had seen them the day before. That's really tough. Please do not do that. Please do not try and figure out whether your, you know, uh, F group yesterday was the same as your F group today. Just start with A each day. Now, in the last, at the bottom there, there's a good symbol or two. If you are, are in the field and you and your team are watching the birds and through whatever types of behavior or movements, you determine that group A and group B are most likely, you feel certain that they are different family groups, draw a double line between those two groups on the map. Make sure it's uh, very evident. You're also gonna write that in your notes, in your comments. Group A and B are different groups. That's really, really helpful to me uh, in interpreting. You know, you all are, are my eyes and ears out there. And I know a lot of you realize when you're surveying that you have two different groups, but you just record the number of birds. And that's the way we did the training for a long time. But now we're, we've recognized that a lot of you, more experienced people and more and team leaders, you know it's two different groups. So tell me that. You know, just write it in your notes and write the symbol between the groups on your map. Next slide. Okay, so I've got some um, examples here of data sheets that are problematic and some of them are pretty good. So this is a section in uh, Ocala National Forest that was surveyed. So if you all can see this, I wish I could point, but um, these are really tiny letters 
and the circle around the letters um, really squashes the letters. It makes it really hard to read. I mean, yes, I can pretty much make it out, but it's tough. Um, so look at G in the top center uh, by the station number 2503-12. Somebody had the page turned to the side and now the G is oriented sideways. That makes it even more difficult. I'll show you an instance in one of the next slides where that's really a problem. Um, so also I'm looking at, um, you know, following the lettering and following the route and you know what, there's no group B on this one. So now I'm wondering, did they see a group B and they forgot to write down information about it? Um, what happened to group B? We've got group A down at the bottom and then just to the north of that at 2503.16, you see another group A. Did they mean group B? I don't know. So, you know, please try and pay attention to that. Um, in the middle of this slide on the map, you see C, D, and E. So this is a situation where it would have been really, really helpful for the team surveying in the field and the note taker to tell me if they thought those are three different family groups or are C and D the same group and E is different or is C different and D and E are the same group. So this is where it would be really helpful um, to use that double, you know, double slash. <laughs> Y'all are funny, some of your comments. Um, so, and then the same situation up at H and I. So H and I in the, you know, upper left at 2503.11, the letters appear to be right there next to the station. So is that one family group? Um, some birds may have flown in later, but this is where you wanna use your knowledge base of behavior. So there may have been a couple of birds there at the station when you arrived, then you had some other birds fly in and they didn't squabble, but maybe they did. That, those are the keys you wanna to use to observe. I mean, scrub behavior, uh, scrub jay behavior is fascinating. Um, enjoy it, you know, study it, learn it, um, and use that behavior to give you the keys to be a better observer and a better data reporter. Next slide. Ah, there you go. So yeah, so it, group A, you know, is that one group? Um, keep going. Uh, next slide. Oh, okay. All right. So this was the data sheet that went with uh, the previous map there. And there's no B, there's no group B on the data sheet too. It, it you know, it, it would have been really helpful if somebody had put me a note at the end there on what happened to group B. You would think that honestly, the whoever's recording the data would realize there was no B when they write, went to write down C. So I really don't know what happened here. Um, it's kind of, kind of confusing. The upper arrow points to a line that says third bird sounded juvenile. So, that's probably a not. Um, so you all have heard on a video, the baby being fed. That's very, very different from the adult calls. So a bird that sounded juvenile is not, I don't know what to do with that, you know, quite honestly. Um, they don't, you know, birds, um, you know, like people have different voices, uh, there's a lot of individual variation. So, the bird, if it uh, is a fledged juvenile, it looks like a juvenile, but um, it, I don't know what sounded like a juvenile means. At the bottom of this sheet, the last line, the person put in group I, two of unknown age and they were in a snag, but I don't know where that snag is. Okay, so I need to know two in snag, 100 feet, you know, west of the point or, you know, 50 feet south of the point, please tell me a little more than just two in snag. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Okay, here's another one. Now this one's really pretty good. Um, this is a pretty good map. So you notice that the, the letters are large, 
they're easily legible to my tired eyes. Um, the circles are big. They've shown arrows uh, moving around. Um, can you draw the snag on the map? Well, just tell me where, just tell me, uh, I assume that your letter is at the, at the place where the snag was, but at the scale of the map, people don't usually know what to do with the scale and the size of the letters that you're writing for the group are bigger, way bigger than the snag. So it's better in relation to the other birds at the point that you saw, if you just tell me where it is, you know, roughly estimate the distance. So this is, this is what I call a good, um, a good survey map. It's very helpful to me. Um, next slide. I think I put in some circles here. So this person uh, recording and the team has told me they saw, they encountered group B at two different areas uh, on either side of a road. And they verified they, as a team, they decided this was the same group. Makes it really easy, you know, for me to determine uh, the approximate location uh, that this family group is using on the landscape. Next slide. Same with group C. They encountered group C at two different locations on the map. This is really helpful. And they verified somehow in the field, um, they verified that this was the same group. So instead of using a different letter, uh, you know, the, the other way you can do it is use a different letter, but tell me you think that, you know, letter C and whatever it was, uh, the other letter are the same group. You can do that too. But it's a lot easier if you just put, use the same letter. Next, it's also very helpful when they're banded. Absolutely. Okay. Um, this was the data sheet that went with that map. Lovely penmanship. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this was really neatly written. It's so helpful, um, especially with the band combinations. Um, makes it super easy uh, to read. So uh, on the line, there are no birds seen or heard. Sometimes people just put a, a dash, you know, a hyphen all the way through. That's fine. But I do like to know you didn't hear any birds either. Um, that, that can be helpful in, in, in interpretation. So I highlighted that. Now at the bottom, you see where um, they, this group, this team reported that groups, uh, letters H and I, were most likely the same group. Uh, just didn't initially see all the uh, juveniles. So that's H and I. So let's go back one slide, Erica. So remember H and I. So up in the upper right there, you see H and I. So they're, they're telling me that G must be a different group and J is a different group, but H and I were the same birds. So they saw H, there's no movement, or I, there's no movement arrows. Um, so those birds were stationary. So that, that's really helpful information when you think that they are the same letter and you haven't used the same letter. Just write a note anywhere on there. Next slide, uh, actually go two slides. Okay, here's an example of you know, having the map, uh, writing the letters on there, all different orientations. Okay, so you might think that's an eye where I'm, where I have the, uh, the arrow pointing there, but that's actually an H because the eye is farther up to the Northwest there um, at 39-30. So there's an eye, but now I'm really confused. Was so that I, you know, it, it's, it just makes it tough. So it's just, you know, please help me by keeping the, uh, your, your scribing oriented in the same direction, um, your sheet, and uh, make sure it's clear to anybody looking at the sheet later on uh, which letters are which. Also, this person used a lowercase g and then used two capital G's. Um, so, you know, th this is not, you know, not not the best. 
Um, it's not super helpful. I can figure it out, but it's just, uh, it, it could be done a little better, a little more orderly. Next slide. Okay, so this sheet is, is fairly neat. I mean, it's, you know, it's certainly legible, but they have crammed all of the uh, map reference uh, letters into the comment section. And that's, in fact, the A's and B's should be in those columns, A, B, C's. And what I would like for you to do is put each letter on its own line. So in other words, survey point 14, you would have used at least two lines. The first line with uh, survey point 14 would have been your information about the A group. And then the second line would be still survey point 14, but you'd be telling me about the B group. Uh, it gets congested. Uh, in there, it's a little, it, you know, if you put a lot of information in the comments, you can, then you're not able to tell me why you thought these were different uh, groups. So you can see on survey station 15, they're telling me there's two birds in the A group, one bird in the B group, two birds in the C group. Um, that's pretty confusing because I'm not sure how they sorted that out. Need more information. Um, farther down near the bottom, there was a female hicking. Uh, this is at station 33, could be group J. Real helpful, thank you. Um, yes, if you, if you think your group K is the same group as group J, please tell me that. I'm emphasizing that a lot, I know, but uh, people just forget to do this. And, and I have faith in you all. I know you have good training. There's a lot of experienced team leaders out there and you can provide that information on your survey sheets. Next slide. This is super helpful. Um, this is something that Carl Miller um, suggested in last year's advanced training. And some people after last year's advanced training started doing this, writing up a summary. Uh, on the bottom of the bottom, you know, the last sheet, you're, take all the space you want. The summary, it, tell me at least, you know, how many family groups total do you think there are? Do you think uh, any of them could be the same group? Uh, and which ones? DNF, this is so wonderful. It's organized. It's, uh, it's well, you know, it's easy to read. DNF could be the same group. ING could be the same group. Definite territory boundaries between these territories and they had marked those on the map. That's really terrific. Yeah, that's a good suggestion, Karen, that uh, giving a, a template for the summary. Yeah, that's a good idea. Jackie, we need to work on that. Okay, next slide. Um, Squiggles, look at that. Okay, so instead of a double boundary, this is two different examples. Uh, on the left side, uh, this team used a, sort of a squiggly line uh, between A and B on the left side to show me that those are two different groups. And then between D and E, they drew a line to show me where they thought the territory boundary was. The group D birds, it only came so far um, up to, they approached the E group, uh, and then they flew back into their own territory. That works also. It's recognizable um, on the right side, the, the map sheet, somebody used the double bar to show that uh, H and I were different family groups, and that works too. This is super helpful information. Okay, next slide. This is the way um, to do um, information that, that needs to run onto more than one line or if you have more than one family group, just put your survey station number. If you put an arrow, um, you know, down there that, me, that tells me that both lines are information about what you saw and heard at survey station 25. Please use all the space you need. Um, you can have as many data sheets as you, as you need out there. So definitely uh, use the space and um, provide me more information rather than less. 
Next slide. How to be a great recorder. So write down everything you know or suspect to be true about the family groups while you're in the field. Next. Draw double lines or you can use a squiggly line or something that obviously tells me that you are really pretty sure these are different J groups. And I think there's one more. Right, because the maps and data sheets are the only thing that I'm going to have when I'm sitting in my office in Tallahassee. Um, so whatever you can show me, record it at the time. Um, that's, that's when it's fresh in your mind. And please do include a brief summary at the end of the survey. If there's only two family groups on the property uh, or one, you don't really need to do that. Um, it's very useful when there are multiple family groups that you encounter along a survey route. Next slide. And that's a lot for today. Um, again, I want to um, ask you all, uh, Jackie will provide you uh, with my, well, my, my email address is marianne.carosi. You can see it on my uh, the little box on the video, the Zoom. It's marianne.carosi at audubon.org. Please feel free to email me um, feedback about this um, presentation, what you want more of, less of, couldn't understand etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. We welcome feedback so we can make uh, the advanced training better every time we do it. Thank you. Great. So one of the questions I saw, everyone, this is Erica again, was um, do jays have different calls for different predators? You know, uh, they do. And that's something I need to find the video or find, uh, get, it, get good descriptions um, of the calls. Yes, they have different, uh, like a lot of animals actually that are, you know, prey. They have different vocalizations for aerial predators versus ground predators. Now, of course, if it's an aerial predator, if it's a bird predator that's flying overhead, all the scrub jays are going to drop to the ground or drop down into the, the uh, scrub oaks. If it is a snake, you're going to see them all pop up to the top um, and, and give that vocalization. They're not going to stay on the ground where the snake is. Um, I will look into that and I appreciate that suggestion. So for everyone asking about the recorded uh, presentations. Jackie is going to send all three out in an email. She has not done that yet, so don't worry, you have not missed anything. We are just waiting for this recording, so we will get that to you guys. Uh, what's the difference between an x.x band on the data sheet and an x dash question mark band, and when are they used? Obviously, I forgot to talk about that. Um, so, x an X means that you have seen the bird's leg and there are no bands on it. That's like a, a negative. A question mark means you could not see the bird's leg well enough to tell the, um, whether there was a band on it or not. So an X dash X is an unbanded bird. It means you saw both legs and there were no bands on either leg. And a question mark dash X means you saw the bird's left leg, could not see the bird's right leg. Okay, great. Someone asked about Marianne's email. So Audubon has moved to a Marianne.Carosi formation for their email. So if you can use Marianne.Carosi at Audubon.org, that's the best one. What is the mechanism we use to do the playback? Um, so each team will be equipped with a playback unit. There are different models uh, being used. Um, it's a hand, it'll be a handheld, uh, something that has an MP3, it could be an MP3 unit and a speaker attached. There are a lot of different types, but each team will be equipped for one of those and will be equipped with the proper vocalizations 
uh, reported on there to use in the playback. Great. So the X at a distance, if seen but then disappears, does it stay as an X with no letter group assigned? Um, so the group in the middle, uh, well, sooner or later that, that sentinel bird will probably drop down um, into, the, into cover, but that doesn't mean the families disappear. The family group is still out there. Um, if you are unable to uh, go, you know, walk into the scrub and find that family, then you should record it as a sentinel bird, you know, one adult, give it a different letter um, because it is a different family group. It's not interacting with the other families closer to you. Um, yeah, beginners should not go out by themselves. Um, you want to, you know, go with your team leader unless you're, uh, you know, really uh, used to being outdoors and, and orienting um, in areas like that. Um, you want to be careful about walking off the road without uh, knowing where you're going because some of these places are pretty large. So you do want to record that as a different group and you may, if you can't get out there, you just record it as one adult and but explain that it's a sentinel. It was showing sentinel behavior, not agitated, but perched and, and observing. So two Dianas have asked this, so I'm just going to reiterate. What do you do when there are bands, but you can't, dis you can't distinguish their colors? How should those be marked? Um, so I'm going to assume what you mean is um, you can't figure out what color the bands are. So this is uh, often the case when the bands are faded. Uh, the original colors fade and they can be kind of weird colors of browns and yellowy greeny things. Um, you want to do, do the best you can. Um, a lot of times that probably the best thing to do is use a question mark for any band that you're not sure about. You can also write in the comment, could not determine color. Um, but you can guess, you know, you're certainly welcome to guess and you, you're welcome to guess. So you might, um, you know, say um, RB-SO for all or or rb dash s for flesh that kind of thing um and and that tells me you don't really you, you don't know i mean it was too it was too difficult to determine in the field so just do your best um but indicate that you the team could not agree on nobody could read the the fourth color or whatever it was okay i'm not gonna lie to you i don't understand this question but maybe you do and if not we can get uh, more information from Paul. Is it safe to say that most groups are relative to the stations and will fly the direction within their group? Um, so the survey stations are just placed, uh, they're placed at typically 150 to 200 meters apart. They're not placed with regard to where family groups might be. So that spacing that we use to set up survey stations is designed to be um, less than, you know, one, uh, it, one family group's territory size, which is about 25 acres. Um, so you could intersect, you, you could have more than one survey station and encounter the same group or adjacent survey stations, you could uh, actually encounter different scrub jay groups. Um, if jays are nearby, when you use the playback, the vocalization, um, if they're there, they will respond in some way, uh, depending on whether they have very young, you know, juveniles that they're guarding. Uh, but typically, because these are very curious birds, they will fly to where you are at the survey station. Okay, thank you, Karen, about the website. We will check that. Um, but like Jackie said, they will both they will both get to Marianne, but eventually that won't happen. So we will fix that. Thank you very much. 
Uh, one says, I've been to the same sites for the last three years and our group has never seen or heard jays. How long do these sites remain if no jays are observed? Um, so we don't usually have volunteer survey sites where there aren't any scrub jays. Um, so I'd be interested in knowing which site that is. And I would also encourage you to go to another site where there are scrub jays because it's pretty depressing to, uh, you know, the effort involved in uh, doing a survey, um, you know, doing 12, 15 on a hot morning and not seeing any scrub jays. Um, some of the sites that have uh, had fewer family groups over time those birds are, they're declining, and at some point they are extirpated. There just aren't any jays anymore. You might be talking about North Peninsula State Park, come to think of it, or Cedar Key Reserve. Um, we are still surveying, Jay Watch still surveys uh, sites where there may not be any jays while they're doing land management to recover the habitat. Um, so we want to know when, at, at what point in time, jays do return. So those sites, like especially state parks, we're continuing to do surveys there, jay watch surveys, um, so that we know when the habitat management uh, made a difference and jays were, were able to recolonize the site. So Jackie answered this one, but for the benefit of everyone, William says, I was taught by EEL to call jays by making a clicking sound with my tongue. Is that a typical way to call them? Or do you think that the jays I was working with conditioned to that sound? Well, the clicking sound is the female's um, sound. So that's, that's, that's the female sound. They actually, like, scrub jays, in some cases, will respond to pishing because the pishing sounds like one of their agitation calls. So psh, 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 that will draw out scrub jays sometimes when you're, when you're close to them. Um, we use playbacks because uh, the speakers broadcast the sound much farther away into the scrub. So uh, you'll get birds responding that were actually farther away from the survey station than if it's just you, you know, pishing or, or hiccuping uh, on the, at the survey station. You'll get a better response. That's why we consistently use playback is to, you know, make sure that that, the, the playback is consistent um, from each site to site and survey station to survey station. Is rotor cutting the major management action if they cannot burn? Yeah, rotary uh, disking or uh, hydrax um, mechanical equipment usually is um, the way that uh, land managers use uh, to restore dense overgrown habitat. Um, the Ridge Rangers in Highlands County use a lot more, uh, use selective cutting of sand pines to restore areas that um, otherwise are good habitat, but they've got overgrown sand pines, and the thing is, if there's a lot of sand pines there and you burn them, uh, the cones on the sand pine open up and drop all the seeds, and then, you know, three years later, you've got the same problem. You've got a lot, a lot of sand pines coming up. So you really have to cut the sand pines, let them dry out, then burn, and then you don't get the seeds, as many of the seeds coming back. So yes, you have to use mechanical if you cannot burn. Do scrub jays fly beyond their territorial scrub to find new sites? If so, how far do they go? Um, so the majority of scrub jays, um, if there's adequate habitat, unoccupied habitat, they don't ever need to move, you know, disperse uh, or move more than a couple miles from where they hatched. But if the scrub is in progressively poor condition, or if it's fully occupied, young uh, birds um, will make flights out off the property, off the site, looking for other scrub and looking, looking for mates, basically. Um, we have found uh, scrub jays in Jaywatch that were 12 to 15 miles um, from where they were banded. 
Um, and I think I heard of one that, at least one that was 25 miles um, from where it was banded. So they occasionally do that. It doesn't happen often. Uh, and we only know it, of course, if the scrub jays are banded, uniquely banded. And they need at least four bands, four uh, color bands to know, uh, to determine a unique identity. Um, how old is a bird when it decides to leave its family groups? Birds can leave their family group when they're one year of age. Um, they're, they're, they're breeding eligible, although they, though I, I, they are more, they're pretty, so in, inexperienced, you know, in their first spring when they're a year old or not even quite a year old, they probably don't breed. Um, but they can leave certainly after uh, their second year, but they could leave uh, first year. Some, some juveniles make forays, they make exploratory forays. When uh, I was working banding Florida grasshopper sparrows, some of the juveniles made some significant movements across the landscape. It's kind of like they're teenagers checking out the, the world around them and then uh, through the winter and then they would return to where, uh, near where they hatched. So Jackie answered this, but again, just for everyone's benefit, will we be shown on site how to use the GPS to locate survey stations or does our experienced team person man the device? Also, how many people are usually in one survey group? Um, in one survey group can be uh, typically two to three or four people in a survey group that's more optimal. Um, solo survey groups aren't really uh, the best way, you know, you can do it, but, you know, the Jays can sneak up on you, you know, behind you, you, mi you miss a lot. There's just not enough pairs of eyes um, to capture uh, scrub Jays or to help some, especially counting uh, adults and juveniles in larger family groups is pretty tough with one person. You have to have a certain skill level to do that. As far as survey stations, um, some of the site managers, like the state park uh, biologists, will mark the survey stations with flagging tape, and they will use a, a black sharpie and write on the tape um, what uh, the station number. Uh, barring that, I think we're, we're kind of moving away from that when we can, because it leaves a lot of plastic in the landscape, and I, I'm not a fan of that. Um, so if the person who's your team leader can uh, use a GPS, as a GPS, they'll be in charge of that. Um, we did do a little workshop at one of our advanced uh, trainings a couple years ago where we uh, did a little GPS uh, handheld unit workshop for all the participants, and we can do that again. Hey, Mary, um, Jackie's answering them to the individuals. That's why I'm repeating them. Oh, okay. Um, Sorry, that was Mary Keith was asking that. Um, is there any courtship behavior? If so, what does it consist of? Well, I don't, I don't know that I'm a, a, uh, an authority on the wide range of the entire range of courtship behavior, but um, feeding, mate feeding is one of the main courtship behaviors um, and preening, allopreening it's called. So, uh, you know, the male will bring um, food you know, select food, like a caterpillar is really select food um, to a female and offer it to her. Um, and that, that, you know, she accepts it, that's pair bonding. Allopreening is when they groom e each other. That's another pair bonding uh, behavior. Um, the males feed the females while they are incubating eggs on the nest. Uh, that's another, you could call it courtship, it's a pair bonding behavior. The helper birds do not feed the female. Only the breeding male feeds the female. So there's a few questions about banding, Marianne. So I'm just going to kind of put them together because I think your answer can address all of them. So are band combos unique to a locale or are they repeated? Is there a list of bands so you don't repeat them? Oh, I saw one more. Uh, are the me... silver bands numbered? Okay, you may have to remind me. Okay, the silver bands, uh, those are aluminum bands. They're issued by um, the Federal Bird Banding Lab. They are uniquely numbered. There's only one bird that ever gets 
a, uh, a, a metal band with a certain number. So those are unique, uh, unique to each bird. Those are reported to the federal government. Um, what were the other questions? So uh, basically oh, the, that was the question. So the colors. Well, people are worried that they're going to repeat the band somehow if they're repeated at different locales. Right. Okay, so once upon a time, in, uh, when scrub jays were initially being uh, researched, there what, and they were being banded at just a handful of places, there were colors, uni uh, colors, particular colors that always went uh, on the leg with the silver band. So Lyonia Preserve um, had, I think it was purple, if I remember correctly. Archbold had a different color. Um, they were all uh, sites actually did have, a, have a, a single color assigned to them. However, over time, with more uh, birds being banded at more sites, that, that color scheme was no longer uh, used, was no longer um, workable. So um, each bander in Florida, so there's only about maybe five, or six people in Florida who have the federal permits necessary to ban scrub jays because they are federally threatened. Um, you have to apply for a um, federal, uh, a threatened and endangered species permit from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to be able to ban scrub jays. And it is not an easy permit to get. Uh, for people who are qualified for the permit, it can take 18 months to, to two years to get the permit. So they all know who each other are and they um, compare their list. They all have uh, color code sheets uh, recording the bands that they have used, the color combos they've used and the ones they plan to use and they coordinate with each other to make sure there's no duplicates. Yeah, I think that was what a lot of these questions were getting at. Here's a more specific question. There's a small population of jays at Hickey Creek Mitigation Park in Alba, Florida. How can I, the land manager, get the jays banded so we can have a better idea of family groups, movement, et cetera? Um, so, <coughs> excuse me, you either have to get the attention of um, the Fish and Wildlife Commission, like Carl Miller, um, or Archbold for some reason uh, to ban them for free or for a fairly nominal fee. I think as a local government, you can hire uh, either David Gordon or um, Monica, I'm gonna space out on her last name, um, Folk. Uh, and they will, and it's $500 a day, uh, which is really not bad. Um, and they will come and band your as many birds as they can capture in a day. They will coordinate ahead of time with you um, to get the birds trap trained. Um, that probably takes a couple of weeks. And a lot of, in a couple of places, um, Jay Watchers, experienced Jay Watchers, um, uh, are doing that trap training um, on site. So you basically take a dummy trap out put peanuts in it and you just hang out and you let the jays go in and out and eat all the peanuts. And you do that, you know, every whatever, a couple days or something for two weeks or so. And then whoever the bander is arrives with the real trap uh, that's remotely controlled or whatever. And they, um, the jays go in there um, and to get the peanuts and boom, the door goes down and the jays are trapped. So then they get banded. Um, so that, that's the way that works, but that it's, it's not super expensive um, to hire uh, a bander to come out and do that. Do you happen to know the status of the scrub jay families at Shamrock Park in Venice since Hurricane Irma in 2018? Well, they're still there, but the, the numbers are declining. There's one family group in the north that has, I think, at least three birds in it. Um, their last, uh, last year, I think there was only a lone female in what used to be the Southern group. Um, yeah, it's pretty sad. Um, those birds are declining. That it, It's really hemmed in by uh, intensively developed um, 
suburban areas, there's no source for scrub jays. There's so many predators out there, you know, between raccoons and snakes and um, house cats that are patrolling the property. Uh, the jays just haven't been able to breed well, breed successfully. Um, a few just comments about GPS usage. It's helpful to have the Avenza mapping app, one person suggested. One person suggested a GPS workshop might be helpful for the future. Also, if we include geocachers in our survey group, they're very experienced with handheld GPS units, absolutely. Um, you already answered the cost question. If a family member seems to be missing during this time of year, is it safe to assume that that bird is part of a pair taking care of slash feeding its partner and nestlings? Um, that, that's probably a, a good, um, it's probably a good guess. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are a few sites where JWAT surveys don't detect any birds, say, on a particular route in a particular area, and then I'll check in with the land manager, the site manager afterwards, and they'll say, yeah, there is a family out there. You know, we know there's a family out there. If they didn't show up, it's probably because they're nesting fairly far from the road, um, and they're not going to, they're not going to come all the way over to the road. So if there's a, there's a fair amount of scrub acreage, away from the road in an area we're using playback, you may not get a response from a family that's actively nesting or in a critical stage of nesting. I'm pretty sure the answer to this is yes, but just as a follow-up, once the banding is done, can the land manager do the follow-up monitoring or does it have to be done by the bander? Well, again, it's, um, Oftentimes it's volunteers or the site manager. If it's a biologist, um, there may be a biologist working at the property um, staff and they will likely do a lot of the follow-up monitoring, but volunteers can be really helpful in that regard also. Do you ever trap train without using peanuts? Um, I think peanuts are strictly it, not meal. I know sometimes uh, people use mealworms. I don't think they use mealworms for trap training though. I could be wrong about that. Pretty much strictly peanuts. All right. I, can there be too many snags per territory? Well, that would be too many trees. Yeah. Um, it, although, so if, Hawks or owls perch in snags, they're visible um, to scrub jays. Um, so that doesn't really provide the predators with any cover. And you can get a lot of snags in habitat that's been restored. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, although the snags can give um, predators a place to nest. Um, so, you know, probably fewer snags is probably better habitat overall now that I think through it. Are playback sounds from birds from that particular area or from other areas to encourage a response? Well, I know people who say that you want to use, um, ideally use playbacks from the region of the state, um, the vocalization. So, and, and I didn't really talk about this, but Vocalizations of scrub jays, you know, there, there are 10 genetic units. They're all somewhat different. And among their differences are slightly different vocalizations. So the birds that live in Ocala National Forest uh, have slightly different vocalizations from birds that live in Sarasota County. And they have different birds that, uh, vocalizations from birds that live at Jonathan Dickinson State Park. Um, I have found that using a very different vocalization uh, really draws uh, a considerable response, a lot of agitation. It brings the birds out quickly. You can count them and move on. But I know uh, some people think that, you know, what they say works better is to have uh, used the local vocalizations. Why are the roots done in a different order each day? Well, so you start your surveys at roughly 7, 7.30 in the morning when it's cool. The birds are gonna respond more because it's cooler. They're moving around the landscape. They're eating, you know, they're feeding, uh, they're more active. 
when you get to the end of the morning, they're hot, it's, you know, you're hot, they're hot, and they are less active. They become less active in the middle of the day. Um, they're less likely to come out. They're not as, they won't respond as readily. So the next day you wanna reverse the order of the stations so you get early in the morning when the birds are active, you get to the last stations that you surveyed in the previous day. So by changing the order, you make sure you get to all of the survey stations um, fairly early in the morning and you get your, your highest um, probability of detecting all the birds in the group early in the morning. Is there a master list of banded birds at the various established sites that people can look up, you know, if they're interested or are scrub jay populations considered confidential slash protected info? You know, that's a good question. Um, I don't, I don't, you know, for private institutions, say Archbold, they don't have to provide, that's not public information. They may or may not provide that. They, they'll probably ask you what you want it for. Um, at public um, institutions or parks, um, they may very well provide you with the master uh, list of color bands that have been used or detected at that site. You can always ask. I would ask the land manager. There's no statewide um, list, though. That, 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 no, that does not exist. Are there any successful sites that you are adding surveys to? Successful sites that we're adding surveys? Like maybe new conservation areas that were restored, or are you adding any sites um, this year? Um, we're not adding any new ones this year because um, with the COVID-19 um, limitations, we really are uh, dependent on site managers to do a lot of the surveys um, and volunteers that they have. So this year we're not adding any new. We do usually add a site or two every year. Um, we add sites at the request of the land manager. Um, when they need help, they don't have the staffing, they want to restore the habitat and they need better information about the scrub jays spatially, you know, how the jays are doing, then they ask us. So lower management districts may ask us to take on a site or a state park, that kind of thing. So we don't go out and just look for properties to add because it's, it's a lot, you know, it's more, every site is more arrangements to make more volunteers to organize, but we're happy to help site managers. Uh, this is a good follow-up to that, actually. Why is there not more focus on private land J populations? Um, because uh, generally speaking, private landowners uh, do not want to have, you know, volunteers, uh, people on their property, um, their private property, um, doing surveys for a federally threatened species. If they have development plans, they they don't necessarily want that known how many scrub jays they have. You know, I hate to say that it's kind of a commentary, but um, if they're not, and if they're not doing anything to maintain the habitat or um, create optimal habitat for the scrub jays, the jays may be declining and they don't really want that feedback, to be honest. Um, and, and some of it is just, uh, you know, people just don't want strangers on their property you know, which is, which is understandable too. What is the term for when it's hot and the jays have their mouths open? Is it panting like you would say in a dog or is there a different term for that? I think there's panting or um, what is the word? Gaping? Both sound right to me actually. Yeah, I think, I think gaping, yeah, is what it is. Jackie wants to know if it's guttering. I haven't heard that one. I have oh, heard guller. Well, guller. Uh, yeah, guller. Uh, yeah, Becky says guller. Yeah, yeah. I'm spacing out on that. I got to look that up. Sorry. Uh, is there a program to relocate jays to good scrub territory that seems to be vacant? For example, Tippy Canoe Mitigation Area in Charlotte County. Also, Emily says it's gull or fluttering. Gull or fluttering. Thank you, That's Emily. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Ding. Thank you. That was it. Bingo. Couldn't, couldn't pull that out of the ether. Hmm. Um, 
So there are a certain number, I, uh, okay, in order to translocate scrub jays, because they're federally threatened, which means move them from one site to another, it requires that federal uh, threatened and endangered species permit. So that means there's five or six people in the state um, right now who have authorization to translocate birds. Um, translocation costs more money than banding because there's a lot of follow-up uh, required. You can't just, you know, open the trap and or open your car carrier and let the jays go and not worry anything about them. So um, right now there uh, is research going on where uh, scrub jays are being translocated from Ocala National Forest to um, two or three sites. They have they have translocated to two or three sites and there's a lot of monitoring going on about the fate of those birds. Um, the translocated birds, they wanna know if, um, are the translocated birds going to be able to uh, be accepted by the other birds? Are they gonna survive? Are they going to, uh, the helper birds uh, breed with other family groups on that property? And that, that's not something you answer within a year. So they do the translocations and then they monitor for several years afterwards. Um, every bird, every scrub jay that's in an isolated setting where you know the number of jays is dropping off cannot be translocated. There's just too many of them there. Unfortunately, there's too many sites like that. And there's just not enough resources. Um, funding, you know, time to go get you know, capture uh, every uh, one or two scrub jays on, on disparate sites and then move them somewhere else. It's just, it's just not possible to do that right now. I wish we could, but. All right. Did I miss any questions, guys? Did I, I just went through. Did I miss anything? Anyone have any last questions? minutes? Any last minute questions? If you think of something later, like I said, we can always, um, you can always email, no problems there. And Jackie will be sending a recording. So if you also think of something, then you can respond directly to that email. Um, for a number of adults or juveniles, do you prefer a dash or zero? It's either one, right, Marianne? Say that again. For number of adults or juveniles, that box on the on the data sheet, oh. prefer a dash or a zero in the column box. Either, as long as it's clear, clearly recorded. Um, I saw somebody asked about scrub jays being the state bird. That's a, a really um, involved question that has a lot of history to it. And um, excuse me, various attempts have been made you know, to get the forest scrub jay to be our state bird, but it's just, there's no active effort that I know about to uh, get that done. All right, folks. Thank you, everybody. These were fabulous questions. Thanks for all the good questions, yeah. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Jackie. We look forward to seeing your guys' data. Yes, yes, indeed. Thanks, everybody.